We'll begin this afternoon by welcoming Rusty Brazil, the founder and executive chairman of RBN Energy. Rusty is known for his expertise in the field of marketing, trading, and purchasing of ed energy commodities, along with his ability to bring clarity to the constant influx of information coming from the energy markets. Please help me in welcoming Rusty Brazil. Thank you, Kermit. Really appreciate not getting canceled this afternoon. <laughs> Sounds like I was lucky to accomplish that. Um, so really appreciate the opportunity to talk to you today. Uh, for those that I don't know or haven't seen any of these presentations that I do before, uh, and as Todd will tell you, I always try to factor in something to do with um, uh, uh, with a rock and roll song whenever I come up with a theme for one of these things. So this time it was pretty obvious. Steppenwolf, Born to be Wild. That was 1968, and I see a few people in the audience who probably remember this song. But yeah, uh, you know, the kind of turmoil that we're going through uh, in the markets these days, it's like nothing that we've ever seen. Uh, we've got, uh, uh, you know, uh, a, a war, We've got high prices, not as high as they were, but they're still high. Uh, we've got uh, weaponized energy. Uh, we heard uh, all about Willis talking about that uh, in the morning. We've got a, a pandemic, recovery from a pandemic. We've got an energy transition uh, that uh, threatens to change a whole lot. We've got an economy that's looking uh, like uh, we could be dealing with a potential recession. We've got wacky politics. We've certainly heard about that from Willis. Uh, and, uh, and, of course, we've got this thing called producer discipline that has a lot of producers that are not drilling as much at these prices as we would have thought they would before. So it's a, it's a really different market, and to understand a market like this, a good place to start is always just with prices. Prices tell you a lot about what a market is going to do. And this is what we've seen in crude oil over the course uh, of the past couple of years. Uh, 80 bucks this time last year, spiked up to 120 bucks uh, after the initial Ukraine invasion, uh, then back again in June, uh, then drifted back down to 80, 90 bucks, uh, and that's uh, and we're, we're not like 87 or so right now, so pretty close back to where we were. Uh, but this kind of volatility that we've seen over the course of the past couple of years, you can be absolutely assured that that's the way it's going to look for a long time to come. Uh, we do a lot of work with natural gas liquids, propane, butane, ethane, natural gasoline, that sort of thing. This is what the pattern has looked like there. Uh, similar pattern, uh, but this year has been a really bad year for uh, natural gas liquids. Way up at 55 bucks right after the invasion, but da now down to, uh, on an average uh, basket basis, uh, to about $30 or so. And one thing to really keep in mind there is really what's happened to the price of propane. Price of propane uh, last year was about 75% of the price of crude oil. This year it's about 40% of the price of crude oil, uh, which is uh, not so good news at all for natural gas processors, for which you've got uh, a lot in this state. Uh, but it's certainly good news for farmers that are using propane to dry their products. And then there is the really crazy commodity, and that's natural gas. Last year, $2.50 in MMBTU. Kind of hard to believe that that's what it was back then. Uh, got up to 10 bucks in June, up again uh, in August, bouncing around ever since. Uh, now uh, somewhere around the $6 range, about $5.80 last time I looked. Uh, all of that volatility has been on the back of a lot of exports of natural gas. Of course, a lot of those exports going to Europe. Natural gas is experiencing now the same kind of volatility that we've seen in crude and products and NGLs that, that, are, that are being caused by what's going on outside of what's happening in the United States. So uh, this is what's happened in the U.S. Those are Henry Hub natural gas prices there in the green. But to compare that to what's happening in Europe, we've got to change something. We've got to change the scale. So instead of $10 at the top uh, of the y-axis there, we'll just change that to $100. 
So that little green line down there at the bottom is those same prices that we lo just looked at. That's the green prices at the bottom of that scale uh, that are the prices for Henry Hub natural gas over the last couple of years. This is the price in Europe. It's been different. So this is what this is called Dutch Tidal Transfer Facility. That's basically their version of Henry Hub, if you will, and started off uh, less than 10 bucks back at the first of 2021. Uh, then uh, bouncing up uh, a couple of times into the 60s and 70s, and then uh, a, a few weeks, a few months back, getting all the way to $100 per MMBTU. $100 per MMBTU when the price here was seven or eight dollars an MMBTU. Um, it would have been even uh, uh, higher than that if we hadn't had some things happen here in the United States that I'll talk about here in a minute, and also that's got a lot of long-term implications that we'll look at. So uh, what does all that mean for production? What has, has, the, has that meant for production? So we'll look again at, at crude oil, uh, natural gas liquids, as, as propane, it's gonna be all natural gas liquids, and natural gas. Uh, this is crude oil. Uh, right before the meltdown, getting all the way up, to, this is total U.S., getting all the way up to 13.1 million barrels a day. Uh, then uh, uh, crude oil right after COVID dropped like a rock, down to 11 million barrels a day. Uh, and then it basically stayed there at 11 for a year, continually getting whacked by those spikes down. Those are, those are hurricanes uh, or the February 2021 deep freeze. So every time something bad happened, uh, in terms of production, those spikes down happen. Uh, but, you know, we're two years later uh, and we're still at right at 12 million barrels a day, 8% off the peak. And if you look at what's happened for the, say the last, um, oh, maybe six months or so, it's just been flat as a pancake, 12 million barrels a day. This is NGL production. So this is propane, uh, butane, ethane, natural gasoline, all added up. Um, so down about a million barrels a day right after COVID, uh, but been moving higher since. And if you look at it, we're about 20% higher than we were before COVID. Uh, and it's in, even been increasing a little bit here lately. So how come would natural gas liquids be increasing while crude oil production was flat, right? Both of these things come out of the same hole in the ground. So what's the problem? or what's the difference? And the difference is natural gas. Natural gas uh, fell right after COVID from 95 BCF down to 85 BCF, about a, but only about 10%. Uh, but then it came back relatively quickly, again, interrupted by hurricanes and the big deep freeze uh, a couple of years ago. But over the course of the past three weeks, natural gas production in the United States has been hitting all-time records. All-time records, I mean 100 BCF a day in the lower 48 states. So production is up, uh, and the, the obvious issue is why is that happening? And it's a combination of things. We'll look at some of those things in just a few minutes, but it's coming out of mainly the of Hermian, uh, the Haynesville, to some extent the Bakken too, uh, but it's happening particularly in the Permian because there is a higher uh, gas to oil ratio for meaning for every barrel that gets produced of oil you get a little bit more gas than you got a, a few years ago. Um, one other thing that's worth mentioning to here and we'll talk more about that gas to oil ratio in a minute is that when you look really close at the numbers particularly on crude oil it turns out that production is not down as much as you might think, at least not where it counts, because that is production out of the major shale basin. So that's the Permian, the Eagleford, the Niobrara, the Bakken, all added up. And when you do that, then production is back up to just about where it was before COVID. So what's going on? All of the legacy basins are down. So nobody's drilling anywhere else besides these key shale basins. And because that's happening that way, production naturally declines uh, in oil and gas wells. And as it does, production declines in other places besides those big shale basins. So let's see just exactly what's been happening at all of those other basins. Down in South Texas, this is Eagleford. It was about 1.4 million barrels a day right before COVID. 
uh, fell hard and is still down uh, about 20% or so, down about 1.1 million barrels a day. Been showing a little bit of life lately. There's more rigs kind of coming in there. Anadarko, uh, oop, wrong button. Anadarko was about uh, 0.6 BCF a day, uh, about 0.6 million barrels a day, 600,000 barrels a day, uh, down about 30% or so. Again, maybe a few more rigs running there. Niobrara in the Rockies, down about 15%. Bakken, uh, still down uh, about 20% or so. We'll look at that in a little more detail in just a minute. But then let's get to the punchline. That's the Permian. So when everybody tells you that the Permian, it's all about the Permian when you get to crude oil, that's what you're talking about there. 15% growth compared to where we were pre-COVID, up 1.4 million barrels a day since then. With this kind of potential, it's no wonder that basically all the other basins have had a hard time getting things going because the productivity of the wells of the producers in the Permian has just been so astronomical. Um, if you wanted to see uh, the Bakken uh, by itself, that's it. Uh, so uh, up to about 1.25 million barrels a day before the 2016 turned down, uh, then uh, dropping to about a million barrels a day, rebounding to about 1.5 million barrels a day before COVID, falling down below one right after COVID, and then climbing back to about 1.1, 1.2 million barrels a day uh, after that, but not showing a heck of a lot of growth. Well, there's things going on there that are worth talking about in a few minutes, particularly on the gas side, but we'll look at that uh, in a few more slides. Where is all of that production growing? Well, for the most part, most of that production growth has been going to exports. So let's see what those exports have looked like over the course of the, uh, the past few years. Uh, exports basically moved from pretty close to zero in 2014 up to about half a million barrels a day going to, uh, but before the non-Canadian export ban was lifted at the end of 15. Uh, then exports took off, growing to, from, from, uh, going to, growing to just over a million barrels a day, uh, averaging uh, on average about uh, uh, in, in 2017 and uh, up to about three million barrels a day uh, here lately. So it's a, it's a big growth rate. It's been a big success story. You can see it's flattened out just a little bit lately. Uh, but we got to keep one thing in mind, particularly when we think about energy independence. And we're going to take this one, do the same thing we did on that other one a few minutes ago. We're going to change the scale and get it. So those are the same numbers. We just changed the Y scale on that graph. And the reason it did that is so we can look at imports. So we are importing less barrels than we used to. It used to be, you know, in, in 2012, it was about 9 million barrels a day. Now we're down to about 6 million barrels a day. But it's still twice as much crude oil is, uh, as that we are exporting. It's going to be that way for a long time. How come? Because the crude oils that we produce in the United States, right here in the Bakken, uh, and most of the rest of the crudes we produce in the United States are light uh, and sweet grades of crude oil. Not exactly what most of the big refineries in the United States were designed to run. They were designed to run heavy and sour crude oils. So what we're doing is we're importing the heavies and sours and we're exporting the lights and the sweets in order to balance things out for the refinery system. Works just fine, but when you think about energy independence, you got to keep this in mind that we're going to continue to import these barrels because it makes a lot of economic sense uh, to do so. You might wonder, where are all of those barrels uh, going, uh, going into the international market from? Where, where are the ports? Well, everything goes off the Gulf Coast. All of the, all of the exports go off the Gulf Coast of crude oil. Uh, there is about 800 and some odd thousand barrels a day that go out of the Houston area, the Houston Ship Channel. Uh, about 300,000 barrels a day, uh, or 200,000 barrels a day uh, from Beaumont, uh, down close to Louisiana. On the other side uh, uh, of the state border in Louisiana, there's a facility known as the Louisiana Offshore Oil Port. It's, a, it's out in, in the middle of the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, and uh, it, it gets uh, about 365,000 barrels a day. Uh, so you say, well, where's all the oil going out of? It's going out of way down in South Texas uh, in, uh, in Corpus Christi. And you say, why in the world is that? 
why in the world would people be taking crude oil that's being produced in the, in the Permian in West Texas and the Eagleford in South Texas and all over and taking it uh, all the way to Corpus Christi? Answer, and several answers, but the most important answer was because Corpus Christi has a deep draft dock. And because of that, they can almost load one of the big ships called Very Large Crude Carrier, or VLCC, they can almost load those things all the way to the all the way to the top, and because they can do that, it's a lot cheaper to ship crude loaded from Corpus than it is from any of those lo other locations. And the crude needs to go needs to be cheap because it's going a long ways. The vast majority of all of these barrels are still going to Asia. Some of these little facilities are sending a lot of crude oil to to uh, to Europe and Europe is taking a lot of barrels, but the big ships, the really large volumes, are still going to Asia. So uh, just a couple other slides before we uh, get to uh, natural gas markets. Uh, said that we do a lot of work on NGLs. Uh, this is what NGL production looks like over the course of the past few years. Uh, NGLs from gas processing, that's the green bars there. Uh, up from about 3.3 million barrels a day in 2015 to 6 million barrels a day today. Uh, the blue area, that's refinery production. It's been flat at about 300,000 barrels a day. So it's mostly stuff coming from natural gas processing plants. As you can imagine, most of that growth is coming from the Permian. So if we put Permian on there, just so you can see how much of it is the, from the Permian, it's up from about 400,000 barrels a day to about 2.2 million barrels a day. And I figured this audience would say, well, so what about the Bakken? And unfortunately, if we put the Bakken on that scale, it doesn't look very large, so we change the scale. And that's what Bakken looks like uh, in terms of growth. So NGL production out of the Bakken is growing uh, all the way from like 170,000 barrels a day uh, in 2015 up to 400,000 barrels a day today uh, and bumping against capacity potentially for gas processing out of the Bakken. So in other words, as this number grows, people need to build more natural gas processing plants or you run into a problem. We'll talk about that problem in a minute. So same question for crude then. With all of this in additional NGLs that, that come along with the crude, with the gas, then where is it going? And the answer, same story that we had for crude oil, it's going to export markets. Ethane, uh, about 2 million barrels a day of production, about 19% of that, that's the dark blue area at the top of the graph, is going to exports. Butane, about 40% out of about a million barrels a day, uh, about a million barrels a day of production, about 40% of that goes to exports. Natural gasoline, uh, out of about 600,000 barrels a day, about 28% of that goes uh, to export markets. The export market there, by the way, is not the same as you might think. It's not going on ships. Uh, it's going to Canada. And they take this stuff all the way from Canada, a lot of it coming from Texas, getting all the way to Alberta, and they stir the stuff up uh, with their heavy crude oil so it'll flow in pipelines and ship it right back down to the United States. That's not the important story here. The important story is propane. About 2 million barrels a day of production, 66% of all propane produced in the United States gets exported to some place the vast majority of it going to Asia. So it's more propane than we use for all the barbecue grills, all the home heating, all the chemical manufacture, everything that we use for propane in the United States, uh, uh, it's only about a third of the, of the propane that we produce. So what does that mean for propane prices? It means, except for unusual circumstances, now the price of propane is almost totally dependent on what happens to international markets. International markets do good. Propane producers in the United States do good. International market, uh, markets uh, 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 hiccup, and uh, the propane market hiccups here in the United States. Only when it gets really cold does, do propane markets react in the United States, and uh, maybe we're gonna see that coming pretty soon. So that's kind of a, a precursor, I think, to what we might see coming in the natural gas market. So let's just look at natural gas. Uh, start off with the regional stuff, same kind of thing that we looked at on crude oil a few minutes ago. 
This is Anadarko uh, uh, down in Oklahoma, uh, still struggling, uh, down from about seven and a half BCF a day before COVID, still uh, only sitting at about six and a half BCF today. Niobrara in the Rockies, come on Niobrara, uh, about five and a half BCF before COVID, 5.2 BCF today. Bakken, doesn't look very big on this graph. We'll look at a better graph of it in a minute. This thing will click. Um, uh, Bakken uh, is up uh, to about uh, three BCF a day. We'll see why this, why this is happening in a minute. Take all those guys off. Permian and Eagleford, scale on these are different in order to be able to see the graph. Huge increases from 22 BCF up to 27 BCF for the combined uh, uh, Texas basins. Uh, in the Haynesville, over most of it's in Louisiana, some of it's in Texas, uh, from 11 BCF up to 15 BCF. And Appalachia uh, uh, in, the, uh, in, 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 the, in Pennsylvania, uh, Ohio, uh, and West Virginia, uh, up from about 2.5 BCF a day uh, uh, in, uh, uh, at the first of this thing in 20 and uh, and basically 15 years ago up to 32 BCF a day uh, in in 2019 but over the course of the past two three years basically pretty flat only 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 up about three BCF a day so one of the things it's always good to do is look at the Appalachia compared to the other two big basins Permian and Haynesville and when you look at that Appalachia is, uh, is about the same as those two other big basins. So lots and lots of growth uh, out of the Appalachian area uh, and, uh, and, and the catch is though, if you look at it real carefully, it looks like it slowed down, has slowed down. And the reason is because it's hit a wall. It's hit a wall meaning that there is not enough pipeline capacity out of that basin in order to be able to support more drilling than just keeping things flat. This is the deal where uh, the Mountain Valley Pipeline, this is the Joe Manchin thing where he was lobbying hard in order to get this pipeline finished. It's all done, but just a few miles, but it's been sitting there with just a few miles left to be completed for years now. It looks like it's gonna be sitting there for a few years more because Manchin's gambit looks like it's not gonna work. So that means uh, that, that what you got in the situation in Appalachia is that production is basically capped out right now, maybe another BCF a day or two, and that's gonna be it. So pipeline capacity restricts the ability for producers to drill for more gas. And that's definitely what's going on there. It does some bad things to the marketplace too, and Appalachia is not the only place with a problem. The other place that's got a problem is the Permian Basin. Gas production has been growing there too. Remember I said that a few minutes ago. Permian Basin natural gas price uh, back in 2019, for a lot of 2019 uh, and, uh, and 18 as well, was less than zero. That means producers who were producing crude and gas and NGLs out of the same well were willing to pay somebody to take their natural gas away so they didn't have to slow their drilling programs. Uh, three pipelines were built. Uh, and after those three pipelines were built, the problem went away. Prices went back up to pretty close to the prices uh, it, it, throughout the rest of the United States until last week. And if you look there at that circle that's on the graph there, what that says is prices last week, at least for a, a few hours one day, got down to negative $2, which means, again, these guys are paying somebody to haul their natural gas away. How come would you have a situation like that? Well, most of the gas is going to be in and around this area called Waha. This is the pricing hub for natural gas out of the Permian. Most of the capacity that, that, it ha that exists to be able to take that gas and go west with it, go to the west coast with it, is already full. And let's face it, people on the west coast don't want any gas anyway. For Mexico, uh, there is more than enough capacity to take more gas out of the Permian into Mexico. There's just not enough pipes on the Mexico side. So that area is constrained as well. 
You can take gas into the mid-continent. Most of that capacity is already maxed out. And until those three new pipelines were built, capacity going into Texas and down to the Gulf Coast, basically trying to get to those LNG exports, that was maxed out too. But those three pipelines were built, and that solved part of the problem for a while. And there are now three new projects that are going to try to solve the problem that the Permian gas producers are dealing with today. Uh, Kinder Morgan's got a project, a little over half a BCF, uh, that's, uh, that's going over into the Houston area. Outfit called Whitewater, along with, uh, with Marathon and Exxon and a couple others are looking at an expansion uh, of a pipeline, another half a BCF or so. These are going to supposed to come on toward the uh, middle of the end of next year. Uh, and then uh, Whitewater, uh, again, a little, little company out of Austin, is also looking at building a big new 2.5 BCF pipeline uh, going into the Houston area as well. And there's a, a smattering of other projects, too, uh, that focus that, uh, that people are trying to, uh, trying to get built. Uh, but what it really means is that until this happens, until sometime next year, maybe sometime in 2024, pricing is going to be a problem in this area. At least for now, every time that there's a, a, a pipeline that has a maintenance issue, it's probably going to force prices into the negative. And then for, at some point in time, we may look, be looking at negative prices uh, for a lot of the time. One of the complicating factors that has happened this year that was not around in 2018 and 2019 was the fact that flaring is under a lot more scrutiny today than it was before. Bakken producers know a lot about flaring. Uh, we'll talk about that in just a minute. Uh, but flaring in the, in the Permian Basin is something that is not going to solve the problem this time. In other words, if I can flare the gas, I don't have to pay somebody to haul it away. So I'm better, better off to flare it unless you've got uh, 100 environmentalists that have got satellites in the air looking, uh, looking over your shoulder every day. And that's exactly the situation that these guys have. So that's where we sit today uh, in the Permian. Uh, we've got a lot of natural gas coming out of the Permian and other basins as well. So same question that we had for crude oil same question that we had for NGLs, where's all this gas going to go? And it's the same answer to exports. Over the past six years, exports of LNG have increased uh, from about uh, zero, from zero six years ago, uh, to about 12% of all production in the U.S. That's that light blue area at the top of the graph there. What that says is that about 12% of everything that we're producing is being exported, mostly in the form of uh, LNG, or all of that is actually in the form of LNG. Would have been about 14% uh, instead of 12%, uh, but there was a terminal uh, called Freeport uh, in uh, the uh, kind of the Galveston area, you might say, uh, that back in June had a fire. It's been knocked offline. It's about two BCF a day that's been locked offline. It's supposed to be back on before the end of this month, uh, but that just means that there was less gas being exported because we didn't have the facilities to do it. Certainly not because there was not enough demand in uh, coming from Europe and Asia. This is what pipeline deliveries of natural gas into all of those LNG export facilities look like. So in other words, somewhere in the 12 BCF a day uh, range. Uh, and, uh, and there was a big drop uh, back in, right after COVID. But by the time you got to October, November, after COVID, everything was uh, back up and running. And again, would be two BCF a day higher than that. If, uh, if we hadn't have had uh, the fire uh, at Freeport. Uh, there's a big chunk of that production going to Europe, uh, and it's, of course, addressing all the issues uh, that we've heard about earlier this morning. Um, you know, every time that we look at the price of natural gas in the newspaper or trade publications, something like that, we're nearly always looking uh, at one location, not all the locations all over the country where gas trades, but we're nearly always looking at this little town uh, in Louisiana uh, that they named Henry Hub a few years ago, where the futures market uh, for natural gas has its uh, delivery point. Um, why is that significant? Well, it didn't used to be significant. Um, I used to work for Texaco, 
uh, Texaco used to run the Henry Hub, and the reason we picked Henry Hub as the delivery point for the, for the New York Mercantile Exchange is because there was so little gas moving through Henry Hub that nobody was worried that it would ever have a problem with curtailment. Because it had been built years ago when there was so much produ production on the Gulf Coast, the production on the Gulf Coast basically fell off, leaving, uh, leaving Henry Hub as kind of a stranded asset, and so we volunteered it for the delivery point for the New York Mercantile Exchange out of Texaco. That's changed. Three of the largest export facilities, uh, Chenier, uh, Venture Global, which is a new facility, and Sempra, uh, at Cameron are right there in Henry Hub's neighborhood. Uh, about nine, uh, anywhere between eight and nine BCF a day on a given day uh, are, is moving out of that Henry Hub area. Uh, there are a bunch more terminals uh, that are in the process of being built in that area. So much so, we're talking giant sucking sound here, right? Because there's a lot of volume, a lot of demand right there next to the Henry Hub. So much so that if this situation wasn't corrected, there would not be nearly enough gas to fill all of those export facilities. And nobody exactly knows what that would mean for the Henry Hub if there's not enough gas to fill the deliveries there. Well, there's nine pipeline projects that are being built to take gas from the northern part of Louisiana uh, around the Haynesville area and other gas that comes into the northern part of Louisiana and move that gas down south. A couple of them are already online, a couple of them are already uh, are under construction right now, and several others are on the drawing board. But as far as Henry Hub is concerned, Pay really close attention to this if you're, if you're looking at natural gas and you're looking at acquiring natural gas, because if you're doing so based on a Henry Hub number, the Henry, num, uh, Henry Hub could, look, could, could, could be weird over the next few years, uh, because it all depends on those pipelines about will they be completed on time, uh, will there be enough gas flowing through those pipelines, and really the big question about what happens if there's not. So that's the, uh, that's the LNG story, or at least most of it. Uh, but I don't want you to leave you, leave you with the impression that the gas market is all about LNG. It's not. Uh, because the largest factor in the 2022 gas market has been something a little closer to home for a lot of folks in this room. This is a graphic uh, that we use to compare uh, what's happening this year versus what's happening last year. In this case, we're doing the April through October comparison of 2021 versus 2022. And you can see there in that bar, supply is up. Supply or production is up by about 3.4 BCF a day. Canadian imports are up by another 800,000 barrels a day, 0.8 BCF. And of course, some of that production is moving uh, in the form of exports, about 0.3 to Mexico, uh, and about 0.9 incremental for LNG. So if that's all that's going in terms of exports, where's all the rest of the production gone? Answer, power. It's gone in the generation of power. And of course, it's higher priced coal, and to some extent, uh, hot weather sucked a lot of gas into the power generation market this year, 3.3 BCF over last year during that period of time. Residential, commercial, down a little bit. Industrial, up a little bit. Uh, but put all that together, and interestingly, the market's kind of balanced to what happened last year. It doesn't really, there's not really, hadn't been a big change on the, on the supply-demand balance this year. Keep in mind, though, that we did have Freeport uh, get knocked out, and that took two BCF uh, out of that export market. So uh, I guess bottom line here is that demand in the power sector uh, that re really balanced the market. And this is, this is what it looks like. This is just a, a, a annualized schematic uh, that shows the seasonal demand curve for natural gas-fired power generation over the past few years. That's all the uh, kind of uh, pastel lines you see there, and then this is what it looks like for this year. So uh, uh, gas-fired power generation is up by about 6%. Uh, that is the case for uh, not only the summer, but the winter too. Uh, and so, you know, no doubt uh, with the Ukraine um, war gonna last however long it's gonna last, 
uh, then uh, coal prices are probably going to be strong for a while, and strong coal prices are really what's driving this lower level of, uh, of uh, or this higher level of power burn. So it's a darn good thing uh, that we had the coal to burn this year, uh, because if we didn't have the coal to burn this year that we did, then we would have gas prices uh, a lot higher than we did. And of course, uh, as, as Willis uh, and, uh, and Todd both said, uh, we, we know what it looks like if you mess that up, because Europeans messed that up. Got ahead of themselves. It's a version of a, uh, a slide, I think, that maybe Todd showed uh, something like this by saying that, you know, uh, uh, the Europeans are really proud of themselves uh, uh, a couple of years ago by saying renewables have exceeded fossil fuels as the main source of power generation. Uh, inside those numbers, they said, you know, uh, wind and solar uh, are, are now uh, ahead of coal. But of course, we know what happened next. Uh, the wind died down, the sun didn't shine as much as they thought. Uh, and this is what happened that we looked at in the first slide, first couple of slides, uh, of what happened to the price uh, of natural gas in Europe. The reason why I put that box around that part of that graph is because that's before the invasion. So the problem had already happened. The European market was already broken before the invasion ever happened. It got worse after, after uh, Putin invaded, but you can make the argument, and I've heard it made, that because the natural gas market was broken, Putin knew he could use energy as, an inter as a weapon more so than he'd ever been able to do before, and this was one of the things that actually encouraged him to make the decision that he did when he made it. Maybe he should have waited later, uh, like Willis said, and that's probably true, but nevertheless, the market was broken before the first tanks ever started rolling. So um, we did that right uh, so far in the United States. I think we'll probably continue to it continue to do so, but we are doing something here in the United States that has the potential to increase our energy prices. And I'm not talking about the energy transition here. Uh, I'm talking about something that most free marketeers support, uh, and that is LNG export capacity, potentially a lot more. Can't read these uh, names up here, but, um, but I'll just give you a sense of it. Uh, somewhere 12.5. 513 BCF of export capacity already exists once reports working again. Another 5.5 BCF uh, that have uh, of projects that have reached final investment decisions that uh, that we are that are absolutely going to get built. Another 2.3 BCF uh, that is, are pretty likely. And that that would give us uh, uh, 20 BCF of export capacity uh, online in just four years. And then there is another 10 BCF or so of capacity that could come online by the time we get out to the end of 2028. If this happened, we would have more than enough LNG export capacity to handle all of the production from the United States that is not being used in the United States. And because we have excess capacity, that would imply that the difference between the prices in the United States for natural gas and the price in Europe and Asia in natural gas would be the cost of getting it there. Call it $3, call it $10, depending on how you want to look at it. Uh, but suffice to say, if that was the case today, the price in Henry Hub today wouldn't be six bucks and change it would be somewhere in the $25 to $30 per MMBTU. Uh, so, you know, pretty unlikely. Presumably sometime uh, in, between now and 2028, the European situation is going to fix itself. Those prices are going to come down, and we wouldn't have anything like that spiking things in, here in the U.S. But even if half these facilities get built, we still have the potential to have a price that is basically dictated by what happens in the international markets for gas, not the luxury that we've had all these years where it's the United States supply demand equation that sets prices here. Nope, it's going to be just like propane, where propane, it, the price is set in international markets, natural gas is here too. This is the uh, supply demand equation that I've just implied. So this is our production forecast. 
This is our forecast of Canadian imports. So uh, going production going from about uh, uh, about 100 BCF a day today up to about 120 uh, by the time we get out to 2028. Residential and commercial flat increasing over that period of time about 15% for power and industrials. A little bit more going to Mexico, but the big ticket item here is a lot more going to LNG. And that is just in the next five years. And when we get out to 2026 and 2027, the way we see it, we could very well have more LNG capacity than we need. So that means if prices are still whatever they are in Europe, our differential to Europe is going to be basically the cost of getting it there. So when you look at that and then you say, well, what are gas prices likely to do? Well, our company doesn't forecast prices for crude and gas. I spent 15 years of my career, a career as a trader, and every time I thought I knew what was going to happen to the price of crude and gas, uh, it did not work out so well for me. The reason I'm not a trader anymore, by the way. Uh, so if you can't guess what it's going to be, well, let's look at the history. That is what natural gas prices have looked like since 2018. I don't think anybody forecasted that. I'd bet you money, not even Todd, forecasted that. Um, there's the forward curve, right? The, the forward curve in the futures market that people look at to give them some sense of what might happen. That's what the forward curve looked like uh, a, a couple of days ago. Going down, you know, back down into the $4 range. With everything that I've just said, anybody believe that that's going to happen? I sure don't. I could, but I sure wouldn't bet on it. If you take the numbers that we had in that supply-demand balance and run it through the supply-demand pricing model, you get something that looks like this, getting up to like 10 bucks by the time we get out to 2018. And again, I am not saying that something like this could happen, but, well, maybe I am saying something like this could happen. I'm not saying that it will happen. But what that means is, drum roll, don't shut down the, those uh, coal plants because you'd feel really bad if you shut down a bunch of coal plants and the price of natural gas went to the moon. Because we know that's exactly what the Europeans did and it ain't worked out so well for them. So let's look at a little closer to home. I said we're gonna look at what's happening here in the Bakken. This is uh, Bakken uh, uh, crude oil uh, prices. Uh, this is uh, uh, basically what's happened here, a uh, speed bump. Uh, back in 2016, getting up to 1.5 million barrels a day, hit the COVID wall, and production is now still down uh, about 300,000 barrels a day from the peak. But what about gas? On the right axis, uh, gas uh, is up. Uh, it was about 3.2 before COVID, 3.2 BCF, and it's back to 3.2 BCF now. So crude oil is uh, uh, basically down, but crude oil is down, but, uh, but gas uh, is back. Several reasons for that. Uh, one of those reasons is that uh, the producers are doing a heck of a lot less flaring, uh, down to about 5% uh, flaring after big numbers, like a third of the gas being flared a few years ago. Producers are drilling in gassier areas. Older wells are getting gassier. Uh, and let's face it, uh, the economics for gas these days look pretty good. But there is a dark side to this. Uh, and that is the fact that if you got more gas, just like we saw in Appalachia, just like we saw in the Permian, bad things can happen. Not only the price, but also the ability to uh, drill the next well. Um, unfortunately for us analysts, the Bakken is complicated because not only does the Bakken production need to find uh, a home, production that comes in from the Canadians. Those darn Canadians want to bring gas into the Permian, into the Bakken, and then move it out again on the same pipelines that Bakken producers are trying to use. So this is a super simplified example of what's going on in the Bakken. So Bakken gas is produced, a little of it still flared. The rest goes to gas processing plants. The gas processing plants, a lot of it goes into the northern border pipeline. Uh, uh, some of that gas uh, it has to compete, though, with Canadian gas that's coming in that same pipeline. And therefore, for every molecule of, of, of Canadian gas that comes in uh, into the state, a molecule of, of Bakken gas 
can't get out. Same thing happening with another pipeline over on the other side of the state with the Alliance pipeline. Uh, so the volume of Canadian gas has been declining over time, uh, but it's not because there's less Canadian gas. Uh, it is because Bakken producers have been pushing Canadian producers out of that pipeline, out of those pipelines, and forcing Canadian producers to find other ways to get their gas uh, to market. Uh, and the only catch is that just can't keep happening infinitely. Uh, ultimately, you run out of capacity and have the danger of hitting the same kind of wall that Appalachia and Permian are now. There's a couple of pipeline projects that are being talked right now. This is one of them. Uh, this is, these graphics are from uh, my good friend, Justin Kringstad, who's out in the audience someplace, so I want to give him credit for that. Um, uh, so this is the WTI, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the WBI, sorry, Grassland South project. Pretty small, repurposes the old Grasslands pipeline to move down to the Cheyenne Hub. Once you get to the Cheyenne Hub uh, in Wyoming, you can get out to lots of other pipelines. And there's another one called Bison Express from TC Energy, the Oil Trans Canada, called the Bison Express. It's a bigger pipeline. They're looking at 2026 for this one. As always, it takes a lot of work to put these projects together. Uh, and uh, you'd certainly think it would be in the best interest of producers to do that. Oop, there's the, there's the map there. Uh, one last kind of semi overcomplicated slide, uh, just to kind of give you a sense of the order of magnitude of this issue. Uh, the graphic here uh, shows dry production, meaning the production that actually needs to get out of the state. Uh, the NGLs that are removed from that dry production that goes uh, into NGL pipelines, then the flaring a lot less than it used to be. These are our forecasts for each of those three streams. And then to make it even more complicated, this is our high, medium, and low cases up on top of that. Really all you need to know is that whenever that dry gas gets to the point where it, 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 the, the combination of what is produced here, less what is demanded here, less what is produced in terms of NGLs here, and less what is flared, ends up being too much for pipelines going out, then we have to drill less wells in order to be able to stay within pipeline capacity because we can't solve all of our problems by flaring anymore. And the catch is that all of those wells, remember it's the same production, it's the crude, same crude oil, natural gas, and NGLs coming out of the same hole in the ground. So when you slow down production of natural gas, you slow down production of crude oil. So exactly when that happens, it's a complicated story but it's certainly something that folks need to be concerned about right now. So the moral to the Bakken story then, and the moral to the rest of what's going on in the global energy markets is volatility, volatility, volatility. These markets are born to be wild, and that's not gonna change anytime soon. Thank you very much for your attention.